May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. As the news of the pending storm kept rolling in yesterday, a friend texted a group text that I'm on with others here in New Haven and said, anyone else feeling like you're just all out of crisis response and decision-making energy? I'm not sure how to handle this on top of everything else. Instantly, I felt a sense of relief in the validation and recognition of what I was feeling reflected in her message. And I see that too in your faces. This storm, no matter how swift or challenging it ends up being, is just one thing on top of many others. COVID, the suffering in Haiti and Afghanistan right now, the stress even paired with the joy of a new semester beginning and transition abounding for new and returning students, and the challenge of looming uncertainty. Uncertainty that has reminded many of us of what it was like in the beginning of COVID, when we'd fluctuate on any given moment between whether or not we were feeling completely optimistic, like all oh, was gonna be great, or absolutely pessimistic, like we're doomed and there's just no good news to come. Today's storm is coming to us in the midst of all of these storms. And this doesn't even mention the storms that may be looming, raging, or settling in your individual lives. So today, in the midst of all of this, what good news does God have for us? What grounding, guiding, or goodness might the Spirit be seeking to impart? Ephesians, I think, and these closing words from Paul to the early Christians in Ephesus have good and instructive news to share. News that has at times been misunderstood, but news that is good nonetheless. You see, when Paul penned this message to the Ephesians and it spread verbally, the early Christians were in the midst of storms and change of their own. Christ had likely died at least 30 years previous to when they heard this message or more. And things were just as hard for the early Christians, if not harder, for they didn't have Christ among them in the same way. Their leader and guide had been murdered at the hands of the Roman Empire. Soldiers with armor, much like the armor, exactly like the armor described in this passage, had crucified him, cast lots over his body, and continued the persecutions of Christians in the years and decades since. You see, in first century AD, this imagery that Paul used the armor of a soldier, a shield and helmet, a pronounced belt, rugged boots and a breastplate. These are symbols and tools of power that would have been instantly recognizable to the early Christians. In fact, these symbols are representations of a kind of power that many of the early Christians likely longed for, power that is associated with strength and might, power that vanquishes a foe, power that instantly communicates authority and respect and don't mess with me. This was the kind of power that many early Christians longed to hold and to wield. After being considered the religious minority for years, facing persecution, marginalization, and violence at the hands of people who wore that uniform, I imagine many of them wanted nothing more than to be able to go and do the same, putting on their own armor and retaliating in vengeance. Many, in fact, hope that this is the kind of savior Christ would be, saving them not only in the spiritual realm, saving their souls, but also saving their bodies, saving them from all earthly powers and persecutions, all forms of oppression, marginalization, and suffering. We hear this in the story of Palm Sunday, when we, which we read every year, when the crowd is chanting Hosanna, welcoming Christ to the Roman city, hoping that he will be like an imperial Roman soldier and king coming to overturn the Roman empire and bring the new kingdom forward where they can feel safe and secure. But as we know, through history, 
this isn't who Christ is, and this isn't how Christ wields power. Instead, as we've witnessed in Jesus's earthly ministry, he didn't wield power so much as share it. Like the story we've been hearing again and again and again in our gospel readings over the past month, if you've been with us, Christ continues to drive home the message that he is like bread, a savior who seeks to feed us, sustain us and transform us like a yeast that will bloom and grow into food that will nurture all people. Christ doesn't compare himself to kings or judges. No, he compares himself to water, living water, a never ending wellspring of life and abundance. As Christ des describes in our gospel reading for today, he abides in his followers, not controlling them or us, not overpowering them, but abiding, standing with, coming alongside, and accompanying in the holiest and fullest sense of the word. So with this, what does it mean then to put on the armor of God, as Paul is talking about? Not the armor of the world, not the armor of power in its earthly form, and not the armor of might, but the armor of Christ. Christians sadly have woefully misunderstood and misread, misused our reading from Ephesians for today, using the scripture to validate vengeful and sinful instincts to wage war in the name of God. I know that you're familiar with this history, whether we look to the Christian crusades, the justification of horrible treatment of native and indigenous communities here in North America, Christian nationalism and its role in hate groups like the KKK then and still now, or Christian movements against the LGBTQ community. Passages such as this passage from Ephesians 6 have been used by some Christians to wield self-serving power in the seeming name of God. But when we really slow down and listen to the text, listen past the images, it becomes clear that Paul isn't seeking to build a physical army of Christians to fight earthly battles. No, Paul is teaching the early Christians and us today that the armor of God subverts the armor of empire and might. When empire utilizes swords of steel and armies to conquer, the armor of God utilizes the way of peace, God's way of truth, God's way of righteousness, of salvation and faith, the ways of the spirit and the gospel. So in a time like now, when much that what once seemed simple is now complex, what are we to do with this teaching and invitation to put on the armor of God? putting on truth and faith like a belt and breastplate, wearing peace and salvation on our head and in our heart, and wielding like a sword, but not like a sword, the ways of the spirit and the gospel. I think we make it simple, as Christ did, turning away from worldly understandings of power that are self-seeking, wrapped in symbols of strength, and instead, we focus on what is nourishing, what is sustaining, what is connective, on sharing what we have, be it food or water or a listening ear and a patient presence. The world, be it Yale or global politics, our parents' expectations, or even our own expectations of ourselves, will at times make us feel that we have to be mighty and excellent and victorious standing firm in worldly embodiments of power and status. But God's way invites us to see with new eyes, subverting what we think we need to value, wealth or popularity, ego or self-sufficiency, and instead connecting us to God and to one another through moments of peace, moments where we tell the truth about how we're doing, and moments where we listen to the truth of others. 
I've seen glimpses of the armor of God in this congregation and on campus since I arrived at Yale first as a divinity student and now as a chaplain and pastor. Glimpses of God's armor made manifest in humanity when a classmate spoke up in class saying, can you explain that again? I don't quite understand. And a sigh of relief would then run through the other classmates who suddenly realized, oh, it wasn't just me who was lost. Glimpses of God's armor shimmering through when a new student is lingering by themselves. You, you, know, you know what it looks like. We've all been there, looking up and looking down at the safety of the phone, looking up, then looking down at the safety of the phone, waiting to get the courage to just say hi or introduce themselves. And then another student boldly but gently introduces themselves and starts up a conversation. I've witnessed glimpses of God's armor making itself manifest just yesterday when friends and neighbors reached out to me asking, how are you doing? Do you feel ready for the storm? As a Coloradan and my wife Kate being from Kansas City, both of us grew up pretty much as far from the ocean as you could be in the US. And these inquiries meant the world to us. Even when the advice was pretty much all the same, charge your phone, put away your lawn furniture, have food you can eat without having to open up the fridge. Suddenly in simple texts, in simple ways of checking in on one another, God's salvation, that saving protective blanket of presence felt more tangible. Like someone was placing a helmet of salvation on my head. When have you seen or shared the beauty of the armor of God recently? Moments when truth set people free. Moments when peace was actualized, when a conflict felt insurmountable. Moments when even in the midst of earthly storms and challenges, the love and provision of God was made manifest. Sure, we're each still gonna have moments of overwhelm, like my friend who texted me yesterday due to storms or classes or health concerns or anxiety or things we don't see coming. We're gonna have moments when it feels like it's all just too much. But as a Christian people, a people connected to one another and to the love of Christ who abides with us in the midst of all things, remember that the power of Christ is everlasting. It might sometimes just feel small, like whispering a prayer, but it is the path of life, life here on earth and life in all that is to come. Our anthem for today is one of our favorites from this past year. It's a collaboration we did in the fall with our UCY choir and the Yale Gospel Choir. Our choir director, Megan Stoll, worked very hard to bring it all together when we were still all figuring out how to do this. And since our Psalm of the day speaks of how good it is to be in the house of God, even as we are apart on Zoom or wondering about the security of our own homes, we couldn't resist hearing it and singing it again tune. So please join us in, in hearing and singing Better Is One Day.
Amen. Thank you to the gospel choir and our choir for that wonderful song. Now I invite you to enter into that place in your spirit where you go when you're ready to pray. I invite you to set aside the distractions, self-consciousness, the next thing on your schedule today, and take this time to be with friends and with God. Let us pray. Holy God, even in the midst of a hurricane, we enter your presence with thanksgiving. Thank you for loving and caring for each of us. Thank you for creating each of us in beauty and with care. Thank you for coming to us in Jesus to reveal the joy, abundance, and justice of your coming kingdom. God, those of us in New England spent the night worried about a coming storm. We pray that as the gospel song says, the storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, alleluia. Watch over our neighbors who might be in danger and guide us all through. As the wind blows and the rain falls, we think of all the storms, literal and metaphorical around us, the storm of COVID-19, which feels like it will never end. We pray for the exhausted doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers, and for all the critical patients and their families for full recovery. And we pray for the social will and sacrifice needed to heal this pandemic across the world. We think of the joyous storm of new and old Yale students arriving this week. We pray that you will give them good friends, supportive mentors, compatible sweet mates, and the realization that you too, their loving God, are here with them in this place. And help all of us to navigate with grace and flexibility the sometimes confusing COVID rules meant to keep us all safe. We do pray for the people of Afghanistan in their storm of armed conflict and political chaos. Guard the women, girls, Christians, and other minorities in danger, and please stop the violence. We pray for those injured and homeless after the earthquake in Haiti. Open the way for help to reach those poorest of our neighbors. Give us the grace to meditate openly on the storms in our own lives family and relationship struggles, fears about our own ability and acceptance, health and mental health challenges, deeply troubling news and civic division, complex decisions we have to make. Whatever our storms, give us trust and faith that the storm will pass over us and we will not be overwhelmed because your spirit gives us strength and peace. In the season of transitions at Yale, Lord, give us the fruits of your spirit for times such as these. Trust, calm, honesty, vulnerability, and confidence. We give thanks for the gifts shared with our church by our friend, Beverly Stearns, and by our wonderful intern, Natalie Benson. And we give thanks for all the new leaders joining us, Noah, Sydney, Daryl, Michael, and many others. We pray for new students, thousands of them, even now loading up the minivans to come to Yale. May Yale be a place that helps them discover who they are and what their gifts might be. Lift the pressure of outside expectations off their shoulders and allow them to simply learn, enjoy, and grow here. Guide to our church the students who need us and help us open our hearts to embrace them. Lord, give us all an extra share of caring and openness as all these storms and worries press in. Help us trust in you even when the skies can be gray and threatening. Help us see each new student or professor or colleague as you see them. Wonderful, complicated, and beloved. Bless us and watch over us as today's storm passes. Now let us join together in the prayer Jesus taught, muted or unmuted as you wish, saying it in whatever language or translation is closest to your heart. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
earth as, on as, earth as, as it is in heaven. They are daily bread with our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. reminder that God is good. We chose that song uh, long ago before we knew that we would literally be in the midst of a storm today. Um, thank you all for being with us today. We're so glad that we were able to gather. A couple of announcements before we send you on our way. Uh, first, you all are invited um, as you're able to stay for our community gathering, which will be on Zoom directly following the post loop. You're welcome to stick around, say hi, we'll react to the service. If you have any questions or things, news you want to share, um, this is a great time for our community to just be connected to one another, and we invite you to stick around. Uh, our offering this week, our offering every week, goes to support um, usually local, but at times when there are many things happening in the world, international nonprofits to help our neighbors in need. This week, uh, our church recommends donating your offering to AmeriCares in order to support Haiti after the devastating earthquake. We've heard that, I mean, Haiti has um, survived so much and the aid effort this time, there's just so much going on in the world, there hasn't been able to be as much focus on it. So as you're able, we recommend, we recommend giving your offering to help support them in this time as they seek to recover. 
looking ahead to next week, change is ahead. Uh, next week, we will be starting our hybrid worship. We're going to be welcoming students. There's already uh, 1,200 first year students that are somehow on campus or doing pre orientation in some way, but all 1,800 of them will be here by next Sunday, as well as returning students and grad students who are coming throughout the week ahead. And we are looking forward to being back in person for our current students, staff, and faculty. We're not going to be able to worship in Battelle due to COVID restrictions right now, but we will be outside and it's a good thing we didn't try that this week. <laughs> um, so you'll have to, we recommend coming in through the gate that is near the church, not Phelps gate, but the one, uh, we'll, we'll have a map that makes it easy to find and an usher to let you in. Um, but you can join us in person, please bring a mask. And we will have um, a tent to at least protect scripture, uh, rain or shine, unless it's really bad, <laughs> we will be there. Um, but we're also going to remain on Zoom. Uh, we know that so many of you are not in Connecticut. And also due to Yale's restrictions, it's only current students, faculty and staff who can come to old campus. And this, this is hard. Um, there's no other way to say it, uh, that we have so many community members that are stalwarts of our community, people who have been with us for decades, some of you who have found us more recently, and it's gonna be strange to not have you there with us in person. Um, but we uh, want to abide by Yale's wisdom and how to keep the community safe and open for as long as possible. So we will be gathering on Zoom as well and doing both, including, uh, and we're gonna be figuring that out as we go together. So this is a new stage in what um, things are gonna look like for our church in this time of COVID, but we are hopeful um, that things will open up uh, further in the future. And if you want to talk about this more, you can come and find us and talk about us or find us at the community gathering. In addition to looking forward to being together next week in this new way, we recognize that this Sunday is also a time of transition for many of us, but for two people in particular. First is Natalie Benson, who has been our amazing intern. She started with us on Zoom and she's ending with us on Zoom. Um, she was our intern last year and our litur liturgical coordinator um, throughout the summer. She'll still be around. Um, she's promised to come and say hi on Sundays. Um, but this will be her last Sunday as one of our fearless leaders. So Natalie, thank you so much. And we'll have a chance to thank you also during the community gathering. Yay, Natalie, you've been just huge for our congregation for so many different reasons. And um, Ian will share also about one of our other members who's transitioning. I just wanna say a word of thanks to Beverly Stearns, a longtime member at UCY who is leaving New Haven as her husband retires from Yale and is moving to Washington State. Uh, Beverly has been one of a small group of older adults who have kept UCY going through all kinds of ups and downs through the decades. Always in her pew, uh, two thirds of the way back on the right. Beverly has always stepped up when we needed her as a last minute scripture reader or communion server, as a volunteer for Chapel on the Green or Columbus House or to cook for Abraham's tent. She's also helped another stalwart, Ralph Burr, get to Patel on Sundays and has kept him connected to us, for which we're grateful. She cares deeply about the people of our church and follows up on problems or concerns expressed to be sure everyone is okay. We will miss Beverly, always gracious, caring, funny, and warm, but hope she stay connected. Thank you, Beverly. We love you, Beverly. It's not gonna be the same, especially once we're back in Mattel and we look to that corner and don't see you or your amazing grandkids and family there with you. Um, you're also welcome to stay for the community gathering as you wish, and, and we can um, send you off. And now let us join together as we end every worship service in our benediction and blessing. These closing words from the prophet Micah, which you'll find in the chat, and I invite you to unmute to join us. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow and bow myself before God, God, on high. God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what, and what does, does the Lord require of you? you? To do justice. To do justice. justice. And to love kindness. To, to love, love kindness. And to walk humbly with your God. To walk, to walk humbly, humbly with, with our God. God. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Go now with the love of God, with the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which surpasses all understanding and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.